student evangelism director for Assemblies of God Youth Ministries. Glad to be here. And uh, I uh, lead Youth Alive and AIM uh, for the youth department in Springfield. And I uh, want to share, uh, I'm going to do three sessions over the next two days. This first one is focused on really longevity and next-gen ministry. And uh, this is what my um, dissertation work was on. Uh, we did the first ever study on uh, what helps an Assembly of God youth pastor or kids pastor stay in the same church for five years or more. We're going to talk about that in this uh, session. And then the next two sessions, one today, uh, we'll talk about next-gen discipleship. And, and then we'll continue that discussion on, on Saturday morning. So tonight, uh, in the second session, we'll just have like an overview, big picture ideas, biblical frameworks for next-gen discipleship. And then uh, tomorrow morning, we'll get into the nitty gritty and do some kind of more detailed things. Uh, so uh, this is my uh, family, uh, my wife and our son. And um, this is on Easter. So we have a long history. My son and I have dressed in the same way on Easter. It's going to be really embarrassing for him when he's 17 or 18. <laughs> We're still doing it. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, but uh, we are from Pennsylvania, so we just moved to Springfield about six months ago, and uh, so our whole family has been in transition, but really interesting story. One of our favorite things to do as a family is we have a camper, and we love to take camping trips, long camping trips, and uh, in 2021, we went from Pennsylvania to California and back in our camper, and last year, we went to Glacier National Park. Of course, we came up through North Dakota. We stopped. And, and saw uh, Theodore Roosevelt National Park and the Knife River Indian Villages and then Fort Union Trading Post. And we've been to Yosemite, we've been to Zion, we've been to Rocky Mountain. And my son's favorite national park is Theodore Roosevelt National Park, yeah. the North <laughs> Unit to be specific. <laughs> he, he loves it. He loved it. Uh, just a wild, wild time. Uh, and so we have a lot of affection in our heart for North Dakota. And, of course, Aaron and Tanya and Phoenix are some of the most humble, awesome people I know mm -hmm. for real. You know, if you're a next-gen leader, you're not supposed to play favorites. Um, but Aaron and Tanya are some of my favorites. Mm -hmm. So they're just so chill and uh, so humble. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, leadership that lasts today. And uh, if you have questions or you want to give feedback along the way, please do that. Um, a lot of people have theory. Uh, and ideas about what helps a, a next-gen leader stay in the same church, uh, what helps achieve longevity. But I, I would just say this, almost everybody's experience is valid in that respect. Uh, we examined a lot of people's experiences in this study, and we did some solid research in this study. Uh, but you may have an anecdote, you might have uh, something that happened to you or something you've experienced that you feel like will contribute to the conversation today. Please share that with us, that would be great. Uh, almost 40%, nearly 40% of Assemblies of God USA adherents are under the age of 25. This is remarkable. Like when other churches, denominations, fellowship, hear our stats about the percentage of our adherences that are young, they tend to be shocked because what we generally see in our nation right now is that churches are aging. Uh, churches are slowly uh, getting older and not getting younger. Uh, in the Assemblies of God, we've been blessed almost for the entirety of our time as a fellowship to be young. In fact, there's a general council address from 1931 by E.S. Williams who said, our movement is largely made up of the young. And so we started young, we've stayed young, we're still young to this day. So many, many people, many of our fellowship, uh, many within our fellowship are going to be impacted by you, by your ministry as a next-gen leader through youth ministry, through youth pastors, through children's ministry, through children's pastors. And uh, one of the things that I would encourage you to know and believe and understand is uh, there are a lot of biblical models for next-gen ministry. Uh, a couple of years ago, I would say about 10 or 15 years ago, I'm a, I am a 24, it'd be 24 years this year that I've been uh, in uh, next-gen ministry uh, full-time. And we have some of you in the room who've been doing it longer, which is great, good for you. Uh, 
I would say about 10 or 15 years ago, we started to experience a trend in next-gen ministry, and particularly in youth ministry. How many of you in here are youth pastors? How many are kids pastors? Okay, good. Uh, we started to experience this trend in youth ministry where uh, Barna was coming out with a lot of research. Um, there was a research study out of Notre Dame and Duke University. Uh, the book for that was called Souls in Transition, and Barna was doing research. And here's what they were discovering. Uh, they were discovering that uh, droves of young people were leaving the church after high school. And some in the church world started to ask questions like, well, is youth ministry even in the Bible? And these questions were appearing in uh, magazine articles and, and all different places. And uh, we discovered a couple things as time went on. As time went on, one of the, one of the things that, that same, the same study, the Duke and Notre Dame study that revealed that people were leaving the church uh, after high school, revealed this years later, that the number one influence, period, far and above any other influence on a student's ability to stay in church or not is mom or dad, parents. Number one. Now, another thing we got to, and took away and learned from that uh, after years was only one Assembly of God student was surveyed in that research. Uh, they surveyed more Muslim students uh, than they did Assemblies of God students because they were really getting a snapshot of the religious lives of American teenagers. So lots of Catholics, lots of Baptists, uh, a handful of Pentecostals, one was Assembly of God, several Muslims, and uh, they discovered these things. Well, there was a researcher in the Assemblies of God, his name is Steve Pulis. He works with Convoy of Hope now. He was uh, the last Youth Alive director that we had. Uh, he was with the youth department until 2013, did his PhD at HUTS. He looked at what helps Assemblies of God students keep their faith after high school. And when his research, here's what he found. Uh, the Barna stat said that 70% of Christian teenagers leave the church after high school. Assemblies of God research found 11% leave after high school. That's a big difference, right? Mm. That is a huge, huge difference. Uh, and he found, in his research, uh, they looked at several different kinds of influences. The top influence on a student keeping their faith after high school was the internal witness of the Holy Spirit. Exercised through prayer and Bible reading. So the students uh, are experiencing uh, the impact of the Holy Spirit in their personal lives. Second, uh, and then they looked at relationships. The biggest relationship that impacts a student's ability was the same, parents. Second to that was uh, friends, and third to that is youth group activities. Mm -hmm. And so um, here's what I would say to you. Uh, number one, the stats of young people leaving their faith after high school uh, are not as doomy and gloomy as what Barna would have us believe. Uh, in fact, George Barna has spoken openly about his, his desire to shock the church into action. Well, good. There's a lot of churches that need to take action. Yeah. Your church, you're here. Your church is already taking action. You're part of that action plan. And what you're doing is making a difference. Uh, so don't give up. Don't stop. The second thing that I would say, and this is even just from my own research, is youth ministry in the Bible. Yes. Uh, Jesus was a youth pastor. I'm going to break out some of the evidence for that in my next session. Uh, but most of the disciples, probably Matthew and Peter, were the only ones over the age of 18. Uh, the rest were young, and there's super strong evidence for that. And we'll talk about that in the next session. But uh, these are some other examples. Moses and Joshua. Uh, in fact, uh, Joshua had a small group, uh, almost, of young people. It talks about Joshua as one of the young men, and it uses two words to describe Joshua. One is uh, Na'ar, which can mean any young man who's not married. And the other one is a word called Buhurim. And the use of these two words together almost certainly points to the idea that Joshua was 12, 13, 14 years old. And Moses had a group of these young men who would basically were like his interns. They would help him. And Scripture talks about this, that Joshua's one. And scripture teaches us, of course, that Moses would take Joshua out to the tent of meeting where Moses would speak face-to-face -face with the Lord. 
And then Moses would leave, and it said Joshua would remain behind. Powerful, powerful image. This is some of the things you're doing with students today. You're taking them to meet face-to-face -face with the Lord. And some of them are choosing even to stay behind and to search out some more. Eli and Samuel is up there. Eli and Samuel, great example of a spiritual leader coming alongside and, and raising up an adolescent in ministry. A lot of us think of Eli as a bad example, right? He lost the Ark of the Covenant. His sons were corrupt, etc., etc. This was his big sin. Uh, was idolatry of the family. It's, scripture says he loved his sons uh, basically more than he loved the Lord. Uh, <coughs> but he also was a very faithful mentor to Samuel. Uh, Samuel actually from a young age had a job to do in the church. Uh, Eli gave him responsibility. It says he would open the doors. Uh, when Samuel starts to hear from the Lord, uh, God's speaking to him, and he goes in to, e to Eli and says, you called me, Lord, and Eli says, I didn't call you. Eli takes the time to teach Samuel how to listen to God. And as Samuel grows in influence, in fact, it says there's several markers in the first chapters of the book of 1 Samuel that say Samuel grew in influence or Samuel grew in reputation before the people of Israel. Eli uh, makes no effort to stop that exercises no insecurity. And uh, so it's a really fascinating study of Eli, who was an incompetent, frankly, leader in the church, uh, or in Israel, really, at the time, but still had an effective impact on the next generation. And one of the things I take away from that is, even on my worst day, God can use me to impact the next generation. Uh, even on my worst day of incompetence or or misguided leadership. Hey, God can still use you. Here's another thing I take away. 1 Samuel chapter 8 says this, that the people of Israel came to Samuel and asked him to appoint a king. And they said to Samuel, because your sons are not like you, they pervert and corrupt justice. They were saying that to Samuel. They said the same thing about Eli's sons. That also teaches me that I have to watch my life, you know, as, uh, as Paul writes, uh, to Timothy, watch your life and your conduct because our students do pick up on us the good things and the bad things mm -hmm. that we show. And uh, Samuel actually ended up repeating some of the patterns that he saw happen in uh, Eli's life. But here's a long, jet, long relationship. Samuel, from the time he was three even, we believe, until the time he became the judge of Israel. Of course, Jesus and the disciples, I'll talk about that. Paul and Timothy, another great biblical example of longevity in ministry. You know, of course, Paul writes to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Anybody know how old Timothy was when Paul said that? He was actually probably 24, 25 when Paul wrote that. I remember preaching inaccurately at one point as a young person. Timothy was a teenager when Paul wrote that. He wasn't. But when Paul started working with Timothy, Timothy was a teenager. He was probably 12 or 13 when uh, Paul took him. And, uh, and Timothy became essentially Paul's rabbinical student. And, of course, you know Paul was a learned rabbi. So he was 12 or 13. And they worked together for probably about 10 years before Paul sent him out to plant a church. And Paul, several times, writing to Timothy and writing to others, says, Timothy is my son. He'll say, Timothy, my dear son, or he'll say, I'm sending you, Timothy, who is my son in the Lord. And so you see this really strong bond develop between two people who, apart from the gospel, didn't really know each other at all. It was ministry that brought them together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, take heart is youth ministry in scripture. Uh, youth ministry is Jesus' primary form of ministry. We'll talk about that in the next session. Not only is youth ministry itself demonstrated by scripture, but also, longevity in youth ministry is the best and perhaps the only model we see of biblical youth ministry. Mm -hmm. Joshua and, Sam, and Moses were together for more than a decade. Eli and Samuel, more than a decade. Jesus actually had the shortest tenure, three to three and a half years with his <laughs> disciples. But we're going to take his divinity as a multiplier and say, <laughs> that's okay. Paul and Timothy, probably together for about ten years before he sends Timothy out into ministry. Now there's a lot of great books that uh, you can snapshot that if you want. These are some great books that are out there that um, talk about longevity and youth ministry. This is probably the most authoritative research-based book that's available on longevity and ministry. 
Um, this book is just surveys youth ministry in general. It doesn't necessarily hone in on Assemblies of God students. Um, these two books here uh, are all by basically the same author, Mark DeVries. And um, one of the things about Mark DeVries, I'll just tell you, he has some good writing. He's also very uh, reformed. Uh, he comes from a Presbyterian perspective. And like he, so he thinks very um, systems-wise. So like in the Assemblies of God, we would say, I'll tell you this later in the session, one of the major factors for us for youth pastors or next-gen leaders to be able to stay in place is the Holy Spirit. And I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. He would not even, that does not even register here. He's going to talk about money, systems, things like that. Still valuable information, but just know it's not going to come from an Assembly of God perspective. This was Duffy Robbins. This was a landmark research. They actually interviewed a lot of Assemblies of God pastors, uh, youth pastors for this book. These are some books by uh, Assemblies of God leaders. Uh, Troy Jones wrote these two books. This is Scotty Gibbons here. Uh, and of course, this is Doug Fields, a great classic. Now, let me ask you this. How long did next-gen pastors typically stay at their church? Youth pastors, kids pastors. Anybody want to take a guess? Two to three years? Three to what have we got? Two to five years. Two to five? Two to five? Nine to 12 months. Nine to 12 months? 14. Anybody else? What is it? Three to four. Three to four? Uh, okay, anybody else? Seven to eight months. Seven to eight months? That is grim, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you win a prize today? <laughs> you won a prize and he's still, still being very negative. <laughs> yeah. So the, the great urban myth of longevity in youth ministry is 18 months. Anybody ever heard that? A youth pastor stays in place. Oh, yeah. So here's one of the things that, that you've got to understand. This is a myth. There is no research basis for this. It's not found anywhere in, except in like blog posts and anecdotal writing. But even like uh, Len Kagler, who I, I told you about, he's got the book that's here uh, in the corner. Uh, he's, a, he's an astounding youth ministry researcher. Uh, he says there's no, he's, every time he sees it written, he asks the author, where did you get that? Well, I heard it from this person who heard it from this person who heard it from this person. It's a myth. Nine months is another one that went around. It's a myth. Um, so I like the one that said two to five years. That's a great like way to. That's a great spread. Uh, it's got to be in there somewhere. Right? <laughs> so three and a half to four and a half years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one year to ten years, somewhere in that range. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. So three and a half to four and a half years. Uh, in the most sociologically sound studies, PhD level studies, they've looked at this. There's never. No one has ever looked at this for the assemblies of God. And my research didn't reveal this either. I, I did not ask the question in my research, why do people leave? If I'd asked why people leave, I probably could have measured that. We asked, why do people stay? Why do people stay in place? And so, um, uh, so, but three and a half to four and a half years. Now let's talk about why people leave. Why do you think youth pastors or kids pastors leave their churches? Anybody have a guess? They don't feel supported by their senior pastor. Oh, that's a great answer. Great answer. Anybody else want to take a guess? Some couldn't get a uh, position of lead pastor and they had that experience elsewhere, so they leave that region. Yeah, and, and let me talk about that for a moment. Um, there is that stepping stone, right, mentality. Uh, people use youth ministry as stepping stone. Um, you can do that, but still serve with longevity and do well. So it's not necessarily a shame. It's, don't be ashamed, uh, Joel. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> God does use kids in youth ministry to develop future leaders of the church. Uh, and you might be in this room and that's you. You know your call's not long-term like or lifetime in youth ministry, but you can still serve a good long tenure faithfully under a leader and uh, serve the students in your church well, uh, mostly for some sort of leadership pain. And I've got these going in kind of an escalating order. Um, uh, you can see here how the percentages go. And it starts to get a little more intense as we go down. Uh, not a lot leaving, leaving for, like, th there is a percentage leaving for personal issues. So these are situations. It's a nice way of saying you got fired. These are youth pastors who got fired. Generally, this is not an Assembly of God survey. This is general youth pastors. Uh, where it gets heavy is in areas of personal conflict. Not so much 
th there is a sin factor and an integrity factor, but where it gets really, really heavy here is in conflict. Look at the number. This is the number one reason here. Conflict with senior pastor. Conflict with other <coughs> church leadership. That could be staff pastors, church board, executive pastor, if you report to that. Philosophy of ministry difference. This is probably tying into both of these. So you can leave for more than one reason. You'll notice the percentages are adding up to more than 100. Now let's talk about burnout. Why people quit. Not why they're fired, but why they quit. They grow weary of spending time with youth. This is real. Uh, if you ever come back from an event that was really powerful for your students and really good, but you think to yourself, I never want to do that again. <laughs> Maybe God is getting ready to move you into a different ministry. That's okay. Better to do that than to be angry and stay in youth ministry and be angry about what you do. Okay. Uh, feelings of personal disorganization, ad inadequacy, growing loss of confidence, financial pressures, that's real, too much criticism, strained family relationships, spiritual dryness, pastor too hard to get along with. Yeah, yeah, again, like this is, uh, and then of course feeling isolated and lonely. This is again is one of the top reasons is some type of conflict with the lead pastor. So in release situations, the top is conflict. Uh, and when people burn out, there's a relational quotient to that as well. So I want to talk a bit about the research design and methodology that we use for this study on longevity and youth ministry in the Assemblies of God. We did look at a lot of the major contributors for this existing literature uh, in the Assemblies of God. We looked at dissertations and theses and measured everything we could find that people had written that was authoritative on assemblies, or not on assemblies, but on longevity and youth ministry. And then we, we, we took all those findings and we measured that against Assemblies of God youth pastors. So these are some of the different characteristics that people found to be uh, significant in their research of longevity and ministry. We took all of these findings and we measured them against Assemblies of God youth pastors. What degree they had, what their relationships were like. Uh, what their logistical situations were, what their spiritual characteristics were. And the study research I'll give you here today, we measured only youth pastors in the Assemblies of God, USA, who were full-time in a church and who had been in that church for five years or more. The gold standard, by the way, for longevity of ministry is seven years. That's like, shoot for that, minimum. Um, we did five years because we didn't think we could find enough that were there seven years. Uh, to make the study authoritative. Uh, we recruited people who participate through relationships, through social media, Facebook groups, uh, AG USA, Leadership Ministry Networks, the DYDs, some, some from North Dakota were participants in this survey. 79 people completed the survey, and uh, it was 150 questions, and um, depending on how heavy each category of characteristics was in our research depends on the number of questions that got asked. We interviewed 24 uh, of those people who filled out a survey to get what they thought. And now I want to give you the results and conclusions of that. And I'll just say this, we're going to do it in uh, these categories. So I'll give you the personal characteristics that lead to longevity for next gen. Most, by the way, uh, of the people who filled out the survey uh, had more than one job in a church. Does anybody here kids and youth? Nobody's kids and youth? You're either kids or youth. You do some of both. Yeah. So about 15% in the survey did both. About 80% uh, or I won't say it's higher than that, like 87% had more than one job in the church. So they were the youth pastor and they were also the media pastor or also the worship pastor. Okay. Uh, relational characteristics, this measures family, um, pastoral uh, interplay relationships. It measures networking relationships. Logistics would be things like salary, uh, days off, uh, working budget, um, how you structure your work, educational characteristics. That's a little self-explanatory. And then spiritual characteristics. So here's what we found in terms of personal characteristics. <laughs> Highest scoring personal characteristics contributing to longevity is that you believe the work has eternal impact. You believe the work has eternal significance. This 4.66, by the way, is out of five. 
So that's pretty high. That's above a 90% uh, commonality amongst, well, it means more than 90% of the people agreed on this point. That you believe it has an eternal impact. You believe it's making a difference for eternity. You believe that, uh, how many of you do all-nighters? Any, anybody? You should stop doing those. <laughs> That's the quickest way to get yourself out of youth ministry. <laughs> but you keep doing them maybe because you believe that it's having a difference, right? You believe that working with young people is making a difference. And I want to tell you that it is. Uh, it is making a difference. How many of you in here are count yourselves in some way a product of kids or youth ministry? Yeah, a significant portion of you. Uh, so it's making an eternal difference, I promise you. Uh, you said uh, this one about support, uh, and maybe you said about pastoral support, but uh, basically youth pastors do need to feel supported. The second highest level, this would come in just over 90%, is feeling like the congregation supports the youth pastor and his or her family personally. This is the second highest scoring personal characteristic contributing to longevity. And so this is like actually feeling like your church cares about you. Not that they support the youth ministry. That's important too. But that you know they care about you. And I do want to say a word about this. Um, no congregation is going to care about you long if you don't care about them also. Yeah. Right? So, you know, um, one, of the, one, of my, one of the things I did in church uh, when I was, I was a youth pastor for five years in Philadelphia and seven and a half years in central Pennsylvania. Uh, after that, I was a Youth Alive missionary for eight years and then a DYD for three years before we moved to Springfield. And when I was a youth pastor uh, at the church, we had, would have an early service and a second service. And the early service in our church was uh, largely uh, elderly congregants. And uh, man, I knew all their names. I would shake their hand sit down and talk with them. A lot of times I didn't feel like it. Uh, you know, and I'm actually a little bit introverted. I'm just on, on the line of being introverted. And uh, so sometimes it was like really grueling for me to leave my office and go down and just be present in the sanctuary half an hour or so or more before church started. But uh, it counts, you know, that counts. And it doesn't just count uh, to put money in your tank. It communicates, uh, or money in your piggy bank, or fuel in your tank. It doesn't just count to have the congregation support you. It communicates to those members of the congregation that you care about them. And I hope you do. I mean, I hope that would be sincere for you. Um, it, was, it grew to be sincere for me as I got to know who they were and heard their stories and uh, prayed for them. Uh, and things like that. So uh, let me just encourage you in any, whatever church you're in, whatever team you're on, we have a saying at the national office, the team I'm on is more important than the team I lead. The team I'm on is more important than the team I lead. I'm on my lead pastor's team. So I try to greet everybody, get to know them, be friends with them. And uh, that's more important than the, than the team that I lead. Uh, so endear yourself uh, in sincere ways by getting to know who your church is, who your people are. Uh, third highest factor was taking intentional steps towards personal growth. This was the third highest characteristics uh, of the characteristics. So what does that mean? Could be reading a book, could mean listening to a podcast to get better, could be you take a degree, uh, a higher ed degree. Could be your working with a ministerial credential. Could be you go to conferences like this to improve your skills, to get better at what you're doing. Um, most young leaders especially uh, need to be growing in order to be satisfied uh, and to be able to stay put uh, in what they are. Um, we're into relational characteristics now. Uh, and there are more personal characteristics, but um, I, I do want to say one word about the personal characteristics, 11%, uh, 9% of the participants we interviewed were not married. Uh, that tells me you don't have to be married to achieve longevity in next-gen ministry. So if you're here, you're single, don't sweat it. Uh, don't worry about it. 
when I started in youth ministry, it was like a lot of lead pastors. Yeah, we're looking for a, a husband and a, and a wife. You know, we, we want that husband, we want that young man to have a wife. And of course, they only wanted men in those days. And so, uh, as you saw from why people leave a church, very few leave for um, moral failures. But that was like every pastor's rationale mm -hmm. in, in those days. We want a young man who's married, that way he's not tempted to, uh, you know, be with one of the young ladies in the youth ministry. If you're here, you're single, uh, don't sweat it. 10% uh, ish of our survey participants, 9% were unmarried, <coughs> single, and they had not just succeeded in youth ministry, they had achieved longevity. They'd done well enough to be a part of this survey. Uh, somewhere around 17% had no kids. Uh, and some who participated in the survey said that uh, having no children helped them to achieve longevity. <laughs> <laughs> An equal number said having kids help them achieve longevity. So there's no rhyme or reason to, to having kids. There, 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 there is some tie-in to finances, which we'll cover here in a little bit. Uh, we tested personalities. Is there a certain personality type that does better to get longevity in youth ministry? The answer is no. No. Uh, there, if you're introverted, you can be a successful youth pastor with longevity. If you're extroverted, you can be a successful pastor with longevity. If, you're, if you've taken one of the animal ones and you're the golden retriever or the otter or the beaver or the lion, there was no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, any one of you can achieve longevity in, in youth ministry. So if the question, if you're asking yourself, like ever, am, am I the right person to do this long term? Um, that, has, that has less to do with who you are in terms of your personality and more to do with, do I believe this is valuable? Am I willing to grow in this ministry? Can I commit myself to this? And we call, we'll talk about call when we get to uh, the spiritual side of things, but relationships were the heaviest category in terms of measuring things for, uh, for youth pastors. And the number one significant relationship that determines whether a youth pastor stays in place or not is the lead pastor youth pastor relationship. The lead pastor or direct supervisor relationship is considered the most important relationship for youth pastor longevity in the age of USA. And the average score of this was 4.79. That's very high. That's uh, like 94, 95%. I mean, that's huge. So what does it mean? Um, it means you better keep a good relationship with your lead pastor. Uh, the details of that um, are, for example, um, one of the top factors under this one was that the youth pastor speaks positively about the lead pastor in public. Mm -hmm. uh, it, another the factor directly under that was that the lead pastor supports the youth pastor mm -hmm. in public. And this is one of the challenging things about measuring relationships is we know relationships are at least a two-way street. And sometimes there's more factors involved than that. There's, there's spousal factors, there's church board member factors that interject or that have say or sway in certain relationships. But far and above, lead pastor, youth pastor relationship is key. Now, in the Assemblies of God, um, the prime unit is the local church. The leader of the local church is the lead pastor. And what does that mean for us as youth pastors, as staff pastors, as kids pastors? It means we have to be loyal. It means we have to see it. And one of the things we measured in a high percentage of, of uh, participants in the research came back and said they feel like part of their job is to be a blessing to their lead pastor. Part of their job is, a uh, big part of their job, maybe all of their job, is to help their, uh, fulfill their lead pastor's vision. For next gen ministry, I think this is really critical and crucial. Some of the, I want to be delicate in how I say this, but there are some youth ministry gurus out there, uh, self appointed kind of youth ministry experts, and they get you to enroll in their systems and they get you to pay a lot of money to learn from them. I have never heard one talk about this in a significant way. 
Most of those people who do their own systems and programs, they're doing it because they've been let go from their church. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> they weren't able to stay there long term, but they were really good at building an attractional youth ministry. Mm -hmm. But they were doing it outside the bounds of what their lead pastor laid out for them. The role of a youth pastor is not to build their own kingdom separate from the church, right. or a kid's right. pastor not to build their own huge thing separate from a church. It is to fill the vision that your lead pastor has for next-gen ministry. And if that sits wrong with you, it's possible that God is calling you to something else, like lead pastor ministry. It, or it's possible that God is calling you to a different church or a different situation where the pastor and your vision is more aligned for next-gen ministry. And that is okay. That is okay. We prefer longevity, but ministry health is even more important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? And ministry health is what leads to longevity. So be very careful with who you listen to and, and who you follow in youth ministry. Uh, We've all seen superstar ministry culture just make a fool of itself over the last five years with moral failures and, and things like that. So just be really careful who you listen to and who you follow. And remember, we're a part of an amazing church, the Assemblies of God. Uh, I, I don't have to say that, even though I'm wearing the badge, okay? <laughs> I'm just thankful uh, to be a part of this fellowship. I was saved in this fellowship. My family was saved in this fellowship, you know? I was educated, I was called, baptized in the Holy Spirit. So this is my church. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so remember, though, that we live in a church uh, and, and exist in a church where the lead pastor leads the local church, and we serve under that person's vision. Yeah. 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 So we always have to submit ourselves to that. Mm -hmm. On my, I, and I'll, I'll just say this. I have never worked under a leader that I agreed with all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never. Uh, there were times when I would, in frustration, look at the youth specialties job board back when it existed. What else is out there for youth ministry, right? <laughs> what else can I do, you know? And I, but I, I generally always stayed where I was because that's what God was saying to do. Uh, and so uh, if you're called to be at the church that you're at and you have some type of conflict with your lead pastor, uh, you need to resolve it. You need to resolve it quick. Uh, you might need to repent. You might need to apologize. You might need to say, hey, what can I do to come in line with your vision? Because if you're called to be somewhere, uh, and you, you well, then you have to figure out how to stay somewhere. Okay? You understand that? Let's move on. Student relationships are the second most significant relationship type. 90% said that... Uh, uh, the average, this was the average preferred uh, higher outcome scores. Basically what that means is the second most relationship, important relationship. And you would think if you're in kid men, if you're in youth ministry, this should be a no-brainer, right? But remember what I said earlier, if you come back from an event and you think, boy, I don't think I want to stay in the room with students anymore. <laughs> it could be that God is getting ready to shift your ministry. Um, there was a great youth pastor at a mega church near us. Uh, where I lived in Pennsylvania, he's a friend of mine, and uh, he never wanted to come to youth camp. Why won't you come to youth camp? He would say, uh, I hate being with students all week. <laughs> <laughs> I hate being in the room with them for the whole week. I mean, I love them, but man, I hate being with them the whole week. And Well, less than a year later, he was doing a site church plant. Uh, he was done with youth ministry. He was a great leader. He was leading a great team in youth ministry, but he himself was no longer a youth pastor. That's okay. It's okay when that happens. But if you are in youth ministry, remember, or kids ministry, student relationships are so key. Youth pastor relationship with the congregation, third most significant relationship. We talked a little bit about this uh, when we talked about the personal characteristics that you feel supported. You also want your youth ministry to feel supported. So it's not just personal support. Uh, it is your general relationship. Does the congregation believe in youth ministry? Are you doing things to foster that by having student testimonies and things in your services? Now let's talk about logistics. Logistics are things like, do you have a day off? Do you have benefits? Do you have, what's your pay like? Um, how do you do your work? Do you, are you a one-person show? Do you work through a team of leaders? 
This is the number one logistical factor that a youth pastor considers a team of leaders to be critical to the youth ministry success. And you can imagine how being a one person show, having to do everything yourself in the ministry uh, over time will wear you down. So having a team around you, this can be parent volunteers, this can be uh, fully formed youth leaders that you take to trainings with you, depending on your size, scope, structure, just find people to help you. Um, second highest logistical characteristics, the youth pastor has a regularly scheduled day off or otherwise consistently takes the day off each week. This is about a 90% factor. Uh, the first church I worked at, I was in Philadelphia for five years. I was called there, the pastor there. Uh, he, was, he was like my Moses, and I was his Joshua. He taught me what it was to meet with God. He taught me what it was to be uh, spirit-empowered and lead uh, in the church in that way. And uh, he passed uh, during COVID. He was one of the nursing home deaths during COVID, uh, unfortunately. Um, but he, uh, he, I asked him for a day off at one point because we had to work every day. And uh, he told me that, um, and I, he said, why do you want a day off? I said, well, I don't want to burn out. And he told me that burnout was for people who don't pray enough. <laughs> <laughs> now he usually didn't come into the office every day till about noon um, he only worked about three days a week I'm convinced the whole time I worked with him I, he was in burnout um, and the church was in decline the whole time I worked for him uh, and so uh, that's the kind of situation where like I was called to be there so I had to figure out how to stay and stay loyally. And I probably wouldn't have told you that story if he hadn't passed away. Um, but uh, the, the whole time I was there, and I love him, even to the, the day he died, if I saw him, I'd give him a hug, I'd thank him, you know. But I had to figure out how to stay there because everything we were doing in terms of days off and work patterns and burnout was completely contrary to what I learned uh, to do. But I had to learn how to stay. And there was a time limit to how long I could stay. Um, but uh, another logistical characteristic, the youth pastor has additional responsibilities or roles to fulfill within the church, making full-time employment possible. The score of this was 88.6%. And uh, I want to hang out here. One of the things we measured was salary. Um, if you ever, uh, one of the things I encountered when I did this research, uh, Mark DeGrise, the Presbyterian brother I told you about who focuses on systems for longevity, he really hits big time on youth pastor salaries. Um, and how big they need to be for retention. Uh, there is some truth to that. And if you ever talk to somebody who's left youth ministry for something else, they might tell you that it's because the pay wasn't good enough. That is a real reason why people leave. That did not come up as a factor, though, as to why people stay. Of the 79 people we interviewed, uh, one made as little as 22000 a year, uh, full-time, uh, one made as high as 75000 a year. That was the highest. The average was about $45,000 uh, a year. The average tenure from all my survey participants was 7.8 years. Okay. Now, in Pennsylvania, that, was not a lot, that would not be a lot of money to live on. Now, but here's what I will tell you. Like, uh, in the Assemblies of God... Nobody wants to admit that they go anywhere or don't go anywhere for money. So when I would survey people, they'd all come back and say money's not a factor. But when I interviewed them, they would say money's not a factor, but. <laughs> so one of the things we measure was home ownership. 85% uh, of the respondents could afford a mortgage payment within a 30-minute vicinity of their church. So that tells me either on a youth pastor's salary, kids pastor's salary, or combined with spousal income or some other form of help, the finances are good enough that the youth pastor or kids pastor can put down roots in the community. And this is how I coach lead pastors today. When they ask me how much should a youth pastor make, I just say, well, if you like them, <laughs> pay them enough that they can afford a mortgage payment in your community and put down roots. It's a lot harder to walk away from a mortgage than from a rental property. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so does money play a role? 
you know, it didn't come up in the survey, but being able to afford a home did come up in the survey. Mm -hmm. So that's significant. Um, a lot of times people start to feel God calling them out of youth ministry when their family starts to grow. <laughs> Again, that's a financial factor. Uh, it's easy, you know, and if you, ever hear a, if you ever hear a lead pastor say this, these words, we just need somebody to come and serve uh, and not worry about salary. There, there's a question about the sustainability of that situation. That typically means they don't have much money to pay somebody. Young, single people, men or women, right out of school, can go do that. When you start to have kids, it gets more challenging. So if you do want to be somewhere long term, I do think you need to say, can we afford to live here? Not how much are we going to make, but can we afford to live here? And the second question then is, so how much do we need to make? Educational characteristics. Uh, again, this ties into the, one of the top personal characteristics. The youth pastor engages in informal practices to stay current in youth ministry and or leadership. That's reading books, listening to podcasts, going to conferences like this or youth ministry conferences. We've got a great new system in the youth department now, Hydrate Youth. I know that you're part of it, right? Uh, and um, you can join that. That's a great way to grow. We meet a couple times a month. Sometimes we have podcasts as, that are part of that to listen to, uh, reading books. Uh, and 84.8% 80, of respondents, some of got youth pastors who've been in the same church five years or more, have ministerial credentials with the fellowship. So that, that's a significant educational finding. It was one of the highest, actually. Uh, we also measured... Um, did they go to a traditional ministry school? Did they go to a school of ministry? Did they go to a master's commission? Things like that. I'll, I'll share that in a minute. But I want to sit on the credentialing one for a second. Um, no, you don't need credentials to be a great youth pastor, but it does say that you're taking your call seriously. Mm -hmm. And it gets you investing uh, into uh, the system uh, of the Assemblies of God and, and of, minister, of being a minister. And so I, I think it, it does say something about how seriously you're taking what God's called you to do and how much you're willing to give into that. So, no, you don't need it. That's not a question of need. I think it's a question about what makes you better and what contributes to your calling more. 83.5% um, had degrees from a traditional college, either an associate's or technical degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctoral degree. Two participants had doctoral degrees. Um, several had master's degrees, several had bachelor's degrees. Um, the percentage for this score was 83.5%. Um, what does that tell me? Um, it tells me probably a traditional uh, school to study for ministry is still the best path if you want to be sustainable in your call. Because college teaches you more than just the stuff. How many of you ever heard a youth pastor or a kids pastor say, I didn't learn anything in Bible college? Anybody ever hear that? It's, it's okay. People say that. In our, my survey, in the interviews in particular, youth pastors would say things like, I used to say my college education was worthless. Now I don't feel that way that I've been in it for a couple years. So most learn to value it over time. Uh, so keep that in mind when it comes to education. Now let's talk about spiritual characteristics. And these are in order. Uh, a tie for the top one. Youth pastor spends time in God's presence on a regular basis, and the youth pastor understands that his or her spiritual health has a direct impact on his or her effectiveness in youth ministry. So, uh, really critical, really uh, crucial there, obviously. Uh, hopefully you're all spending time with the Lord. Um, we did measure things like prayer and Bible reading. We measured speaking in tongues even uh, in this. Um, and what was, most, what, what was most significant is just that people are spending time with God. So whatever that looks like for you, whatever that looks like for you, uh, youth pastor practices some spiritual discipline several times each year or more. That was high. And here's a big one. The Holy Spirit plays a major, major role in the youth pastor's ability to achieve youth ministry longevity. This is the first time we're aware of that the, the impact of the Holy Spirit's ever been measured in terms of longevity in youth ministry. And, um, you know, I referenced earlier on occasion I'd have a conflict with my lead pastor and I'd go and I'd look at the job boards for youth ministry. I see what's out there. I explore that. And after I'd, 
you know, blew off steam that way, it, uh, my tenure at a church always comes down to one question. God, what are you saying? You know, God, what are you saying to me to do? Uh, and the question almost always was stay. In fact, every time I initiated a change, the answer was, I started to look at a change, the answer was stay. The only times the Lord said to go for me was when somebody else came to me and said, have you, have you considered this? We'd like you to do this. And I'd say, well, I pray about it. You know, those are the only times the Lord said to go. In fact, that's, that's even to our most recent move to Springfield, same thing. Um, so uh, what, what, what is the meaning of that? Simply this. Uh, the Holy Spirit's a major player in your ability to sustain your call. We measured the call of God in terms of staying in youth ministry. Here's what we found. Several people in the interview used this word. The, my call is my anchor. My call is my anchor. Keeps me in place. So on the tough days, what is your call? You get a different lead pastor. What is your call? Uh, you have a parent who gives you a hard time. What is your call? Uh, you're struggling. They're not listening. What is your call? Uh, what is your call? What is God calling you to do? And uh, how are you asking the Holy Spirit to inform what you're doing on a regular, regular basis? So uh, I want to just stop and answer any questions you guys might have. Uh, we're done about 10 minutes early. We've got plenty of time for questions. And some of that I sped <laughs> through. We asked 150 questions in the survey. I put up like the top 10 to 15 answers. So there's a lot more there if you want to ask questions. Where can we get a hold of that survey? So uh, I'll, I can send it to you. That'd be great. It is published through ProQuest. Uh, and then next year in March 2024, there will be a book out through My Healthy Church that is uh, not academic, but, you know, it'll, it'll, it's based on the research. So, but I can see me after and I'll send you a copy. So, yeah. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Yeah. So I'm not youth ministry, so I can say this. Is yeah. uh, what happens when you're at a church and your your senior pastor has no vision yeah. for you? Like, how do you it's a great question. work within his boundaries? It's a great question. And um, I think that was, my first church was like that. Um, and my second church was like that a little bit too. I mean, he had a vision to reach the lost with the second church I worked at, but no like vision statement for the church. In both situations, they preferred siloed ministries. So kids did whatever they wanted, youth did whatever they wanted. And I'm just gonna speak from my own experience. Um, so, so I filled that silo <laughs> as best as I could. Um, because there were not really guidelines or boundaries. He, the pastor was just like, well, you hear from God and do a great job. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Um, so there, there is, and sometimes there's like just a sense of release when that happens, you know. And other times I think if you do need to serve under a youth, a pastor that has a really strong vision, um, then I think it's time to seek the Lord as to, um, am I still supposed to be here? You know, we, we, I've seen youth pastors leave because they want to be led and they're not getting it from their current lead pastor. Um, so uh, seek the Lord is what I would say. Uh, it's never the job of a kids or youth pastor to give their lead pastor a vision though. Mm -hmm. It is your job to say, I have this vision for youth, I have this vision for kids, but you cannot dictate to your lead pastor what their vision should be. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about education here. We talked about informally growing in different processes. Um, one of the things that inevitably happens in ministry, because if you're called to lead a youth ministry, kids ministry, lead pastor, then you're a leader. And if you're growing in leadership, there's a good chance you will outgrow the leader you're serving under if they're not personally working to grow and develop. So in those instances, it comes back to your call. What am I called to do? What am I called to be? Um, I worked for a lead pastor for seven and a half years who I love. He was my youth pastor when I was a kid. Um, 
have a doctoral degree. He would openly brag about getting through college with these. <laughs> um, God called me to stay there uh, for seven and a half years before I became a youth live missionary. And I stayed, I was able to stay loyal and faithful, you know what I mean? And I can't, I could not dictate to him a vision. I would sit in leadership classes and hear things like, that were completely wrong that we were doing in our church. Like I hear the right way to do it. And it was like, well, I, but, but I prayed about this one time actually. And the Lord said to me, um, personally, uh, it was a mistake, a leadership mistake that was happening. And the Lord said to me, it might be a mistake, but it's the pastor's mistake to make. Mm -hmm. And I would rather have him make that mistake than put you in the role to make that decision. Mm -hmm. So I just took it as a, okay, Lord, I'm going to, I have a silo to build. That's what he wants me to do, this pastor, so that's what I'm going to do. So I think you just have to, again, lean into your call. Don't assume to give your pastor vision. Um, and and the team you're on is more important than the team you lead. So, yeah. Anybody else? Questions, concerns, comments, criticism? Anybody have a story they want to share? Well, ministry's wild. It's a wild, wild ride, and we're in a wild, wild time. So let me pray for you. We're going to do another session, a couple minutes, and it'll be a next gen discipleship. It'll be an overview. I'll give you some biblical principles from the life of Jesus. We'll talk about the seven dimensions, a little bit of a spirit empowered believer, and uh, set up a framework to do a workshop style session tomorrow. God, thanks for these leaders who you have called. Several of them are kid men leaders, several of them are youth ministry leaders. All of us are called to serve generally in this room on a team. We serve under leaders that you've called us to serve under. And uh, so, Lord, I just pray that you would sustain uh, these awesome North Dakota leaders and their call. I pray that you would help them to have endurance, to spend time with you, to cultivate a great relationship with their lead pastor or their direct supervisor. I pray that you would help them to grow personally in the ministry. And God, I pray that they would rely on your Holy Spirit to guide them, both on the tough and the easy days. God, we need you. Help us to serve you well in the call you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody.